Thank you so much for coming today. Really excited to see uh, such a good crowd and, and, and the folks in it. Um, I'm Kevin Hales. I'm an attorney for uh, Cisco Systems and RTP, um, and I'm head of the Triangle Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society is an organization of over 40,000 lawyers, law students, and other individuals who believe and trust that individual citizens can make the best choices for themselves and society. The Triangle Lawyers Chapter is one of many local chapters that seek to foster a serious dialogue about issues of individual liberty. Uh, today, we are delighted to have John Allison, Executive in Residence at the Wake Forest School of Business. Uh, he is a member currently of Cato, the Cato Institute's Board of Directors, and uh, he is Chairman of the Executive Advisory Council of the Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. <clears throat> Mr. Allison was previously President and CEO of the Cato Institute, and uh, prior to joining Cato, as many of you know, he was uh, Chairman and CEO of BB&T Corporation. Uh, during his tenure as CEO, BB&T grew from $4.5 billion uh, to $152 billion in assets. He was recognized by the Harvard Business Review as one of the top 100 most successful CEOs in the world uh, over the last decade. Mr. Allison is the author of two excellent books with long, compelling titles. Uh, <laughs> one is The Financial Crisis and the Free Market Cure, Why Pure Capitalism is the World Economy's Only Hope, and uh, The Leadership Crisis and the Free Market Cure, Why the Future of Business Depends on the Return to Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And make sure you pick up your copy. The, the books there on the table at the front are free. So on your way out, grab a copy. They are, they are, they are free for the taking. Yep. Um, and we got a bunch. If, if, if they run out, I've got, other, I've got boxes. Also, grab yourself some, uh, some uh, dessert. You know, last time we had a lot of dessert left over, so don't want to see that again. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, Mr. Allison is also uh, a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill here. Um, he received, I won't hold that against him, I'm an NC State guy. Uh, he received his, well, I mean, I'm a UNC guy for law school, but that doesn't count. Um, he, uh, he received his master's degree in management from Duke University, and he's also a graduate of the Stonier uh, Graduate School of Banking. Please join me in providing a warm welcome to Mr. John Allison. Thanks, Kevin, and uh, good day. It's really a pleasure to be here. I always enjoy talking to uh, Federal Society groups. Uh, I'm like, it's very hopeful to see lawyers that want to defend individual rights. That's uh, very important. My topic on my presentation today is a philosophical fight for the future of America. Um, I think that this fight is going to have a profound, is having a profound influence on the quality of your lives and the quality of your lives and your children's lives. I don't think we're fighting about the superficial stuff you hear in the press. We're fighting over very fundamental principles. Before I get into my presentation, I just want to give you a little uh, elevator speech on Cato. I know some of you are familiar with Cato, but let me give you my elevator speech because it gives you a little context. Ele uh, Cato is the world's leading libertarian think tank. Cato's mission is to create a free and prosperous society based on the principles of individual liberty, free markets, limited government, and peace. We really do believe in limited government. We think the government ought to stay out of your pocketbook, but we also think it ought to stay out of your bedroom. We think government has a very important but very limited role. The purpose of government is to protect individual rights. Uh, it's to keep me from using fraud, force of fraud to take what you've earned and to keep you from using force of fraud to take what I've earned. So the government is in the business of protecting individual rights. Uh, in that context, we think the government has three legitimate roles. One is uh, national defense to protect us from bad guys overseas. Secondly is police to protect us from bad guys in our neighborhood. And finally is an effective court system so that when you and I have a legitimate dispute, uh, we can settle it without resort to violence. In our ideal world, there'd be 95% less regulations and far more effective courts than we have today. The reason we think government power needs to be limited is government has a unique and very dangerous authority. It has the authority to initiate the use of force. Uh, government has guns. Walmart can beg you to buy their products. They can offer you special deals, but they can't make you. The government can make you. They can take your property. They can put you in jail. They can kill you. 
In fact, governments have killed hundreds and millions of people throughout history. Governments are very dangerous. In addition, commonsensically, relationships that are voluntary are better than relationships based on force. And government is about the use of force. It's about people with guns making people do things that they don't want to do. So anytime you support new legislation, ask yourself, would you take a gun and make somebody do that? Because that's what happens when a law gets passed. All right, in that context, let me talk about this philosophic fight for the future of America. On one side are those of us in what I call the classical liberal tradition. The defenders of the principles that we think made America great. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'll talk about our side in a minute. <clears throat> On the other side are the status of all kinds. Status are people that believe fundamentally government has a solution to the problems. There are plenty of right-wing status. Most right-wing status are more interested in controlling your personal life. That left-wing states tend to be more interested in your control and your money, although now they've gotten very interested in your personal lives. And the most visible form of statism today is the so-called progressive, the radical uh, left movement. Uh, it's an old movement, goes back over 100 years, but it's become far more powerful in recent times, uh, even though it failed years ago. Progressives deeply believe that a group of elitists in Washington, D.C. know what's better for you. They know how to make your life better. And they always are going to act in the common good. They're, they're, they're going to always do what's good for, uh, for the common, common good. Um, underlying the progressive movement are three fundamental philosophical principles. Altruism, uh, collectivism, and egalitarianism. Um, altruism. Altruism is not benevolence. Benevolence is a really good thing. Altruism is otherism. It says everybody's important but you. Everybody's important but you. The problem with that is there are only but yous. There's you, 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 you. And if none of the yous matter, individuals aren't important. What is important in the measure of performance is the so-called collective, the good of the group. And individuals are irrelevant. Um, and that leads to collectivism. And collectivists always argue that they are acting in the so-called common good. Here's a problem with that. The common good as presented by modern progressives is really an oxymoron. When the founding fathers got through with the common good, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, through the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, they pretty much defined all the real common goods. Today, what we're really talking about when somebody says the common good is good for me, not so good for you. Good for you, not so good for me. Good for my group, not so good for your group. Good for the, uh, the taxi drivers, not good for Uber. Good for the teachers, maybe not so good for the, teach, uh, for the students. Good for General Electric, not necessarily good for General Electric's competitors. And so what you have going on in Washington, D.C. today is group warfare. Everybody, quote, representing the common good. And by the way, if something were really equally good for all of us, would we be arguing about it? We wouldn't. So common good as presented by progressives is really an oxymoron. Underlying the progressives movement, and this is really critical in terms of what people think politically, is their sense of justice. Your sense of justice largely drives where you are on the political spectrum. And the progressive sense of justice is what I call radical egalitarianism. Now, to some degree, the United States is an egalitarian society. All, all men were created equal. But when the founders of the United States were talking about all men being created equal, they were talking about equal for the law. Just because you were the son of a baron didn't give you any special rights. The progressive concept of, of egalitarianism is equal outcome. Equal outcome. Now, while it's true that everybody ought to be equal for the law, and it's true that every human being ought to be treated with dignity and respect. It is not true that everybody is equal. Every person in this room is a unique, special individual. We all have different strengths, different weaknesses, different abilities, different goals, different objectives. Uh, that's great. That's what makes human nature so interesting. We're all unique, special individuals. But we're not equal. At the extreme, uh, Thomas Edison and the Boston Strangler are not equal. The only way to get equal outcomes from unequal people 
is to use force to take what one person has earned and give it to somebody that's not earned it. So progressives are in the business of using force to take what one person has earned. It, doesn't, it can be money, but it can be lots of other stuff, and give it to people that haven't earned it. Let me concretize that for you. This, I'll tell you a story, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how old I am, where I went to school. Uh, one of my heroes was uh, Michael Jordan. I thought Michael Jordan was a really great basketball player, but a real inspiration for poor kids. This will surprise you. I am not as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. There's a serious differential in performance. What's interesting, however, is that I can't be as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. I don't care how hard I try, how hard you tried to help me, I cannot be as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. You cannot make the average great. If you can make the average better, that may be a very productive, very noble thing to do, but you can't make the average great. However, you can make the great average. Progressives, by definition, in their egalitarian focus, are in the business of making the great average. It's very easy to make Michael Jordan as good a basketball player as me. You just cut his legs off, right? You say, well, we wouldn't do that. I don't know. We've been pretty tough on great people throughout history. You know, Poison, Socrates, and Prison Galileo, Vern, Joan of Arc. We're more sophisticated today. We do it with lots of balls and chains, lots of government rules and regulations, lots of high tax rates. What people fail to realize is that great people make a disproportionate contribution to human well-being. Everybody in this room, your children, your grandchildren, have a better life thanks to Tom says. As not only invented the light bulb, he invented the rectal generation, he invented the research laboratory itself. Put balls and chains on great people and reduce the quality of life for all of us. Egalitarians like to claim the moral high ground. And he that owns the moral high ground wins the fight. Conservatives often make a very bad mistake, and having been a business person, I get this mistake because I made it a lot. We think it's over, the arguments are over economics. We won the economics argument, arguments back in 1776 when uh, uh, Adam Smith published Wealth of the Nation. We won those arguments a long time ago. The arguments are over ethics. And progressives like to take the moral high ground because who can argue with everybody being equal? I don't think they have the moral high ground. What motivates progressives is the most destructive of all human emotions, and watch it in yourself. It's called envy. It's hatred of the good for being the good. You know, uh, egalitarianism is a lot worse than I just described. Because here's the fact. Any human attribute, half the people are below average by definition. Half the people are below average in intelligence, in athletic ability, in artistic ability. The only way to make everybody equal is to go down literally to the lowest common denominator. I'll, I'll concretize that before you. I was uh, raised in a church where the uh, preacher wanted everybody to sing very loud except me. I am a really bad singer. <laughs> it would be a tragedy if everybody had to sing as poorly as I sing. A lot of joy would go out of the world. <laughs> and I would lose too, right? Now when you confront, I get to debate progressives at Cato, left, left wing people at Cato, it's always interesting. Uh, they'll, they'll always back away and say, oh, we don't really mean to go that far. So here's my question, how far do you mean to go? You're not going to cut Michael George's legs off, how, three toes, four toes? <laughs> and here's the big question, who decides how many toes? That's when the power lusters, the tyrants show up. That's when Elizabeth Warren joins the party, right? Because <laughs> she knows exactly how many toes ought to be cut off. And then they'll back up again and say, well, I don't exactly mean that. What I mean is we want equal opportunity. Interestingly enough, equal opportunity is another oxymoron. Half the people are born above average in intelligence, half below average, half above average in, in athletic ability, half below. What combination does all that look like? And those of you that are in my age group, you see this over and over again. Siblings, same genetic pool, went to the same school, same socioeconomic class, same everything radically different outcomes. The founding fathers had it right. It was equality before the law that matters. Equality before the law. How about the other side of the argument, the classical liberal tradition? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each individual's unconditional moral right to their own life. 
Each individual's unconditional moral right to the pursuit of their personal happiness. Each individual's unconditional moral right to the product of their labor. If you produce a lot, you get a lot, including the right to give it away to whoever you want to for whatever reason you want to. And if you think about that set of moral prerogatives, it demands personal responsibility. It rewards self-discipline. It rewards productivity. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Classical liberals are primarily in the liberal, liberty business. We're primarily in the liberty business. And a lot of people pay lip service to liberty, but uh, what libertarians and classical liberals understand is liberty is not just nice. It is nice, but it is also essential for human well-being, both physical well-being and spiritual well-being. In the physical sense, in order to be productive, in order to be innovative, in order to be creative, you have to be able to think for yourself. If somebody forces you to act like two plus two is five, you literally cannot think. And lots of government rules and regulations force people to act like two plus two is five. In addition, all human progress, 100%, is based on innovation and creativity. Unless somebody does something better, there could be no progress. And anything better is different. Creativity and innovation is only possible to an independent thinker. Somebody that thinks like the crowd cannot be innovative, cannot be creative, cannot contribute to human progress. That's why entrepreneurs are so important. Entrepreneurs take the ideas of scientists and engineers and turn them into reality. Without entrepreneurship, there's literally no human progress. And what about entrepreneurs? What do they do? They're experimenters. They fail and try again. For every Google, there are 10,000 failed Googles. For every Walmart, there's 100,000 failed Walmarts. Entrepreneurs think out of the box. They think differently. They have to be able to think independently. They have to be free to pursue their odd thoughts. When I was in college, if somebody presented me an iPhone and told me, you know, in my lifetime, we're going to have a phone that can do everything an iPhone can do, I'd have said, that's interesting, maybe in 500 years. You know, if, I don't know how Steve Jobs saw an iPhone. He saw it though. Make a list of all the innovations that came out of the Soviet Union or North Korea or Cuba. It's a really short list. Communism and socialism is always doomed to failure. It's failed over and over again because it destroys innovation and creativity, which is the source of all human progress. Make a list of all the innovative, creative ideas that have come out of government bureaucrats, the hundreds of thousands of government bureaucrats in the United States. It's another very short list. Cato published a book about 18 months ago called Poverty and Progress that looked at human well-being and time immemorial. From the evolution of, of Homo sapiens 250,000 years ago to the late 1700s, life expectancy basically was the same. There may have been some improvement in the quality of life, not a lot, but life expectancy was the same. And then something happened in the late 1700s that transformed both the quality of life and life expectancy, first in Western civilization and now it's doing all over, over the rest of the world. There was an invention far more important than fire, more important than the wheel. It was the invention of rule of law, of individual rights, of free markets, of the social system we call capitalism. And capitalism is the only system that allows innovation and creativity that rewards those that produce the most productive ideas. And capitalism has transformed the quality of life on this planet because it allows people to be free, to have liberty to pursue their truths. So liberty is essential for human physical well-being. It's also essential for human spiritual well-being in the context of the pursuit of happiness. And when I talk about the pursuit of happiness, I'm not talking about having a good time on Friday night, although sometimes it's good to have a good time on Friday night. I'm talking about happiness in the Aristotelian sense of a life well lived. When I call blood, sweat, and tears happiness. When you're 80 years old, you look back and say, man, that was hard, and I'm glad I did it. Happiness in that context has to be earned. You cannot be entitled to be happy. To earn happiness, you have to have a sense of purpose. You have to develop uh, strategies to accomplish that purpose, and you have to act to accomplish those strategies consistent with your beliefs and your values as a free and independent person. Now being free doesn't guarantee you'll be happy, but being unfree guarantees you cannot be happy. 
So liberty is essential for human physical well-being, but it's equally important for human spiritual well-being. Um, let's talk a little more about the pursuit of happiness. I would argue that the world-changing idea in the Declaration of Independence is the pursuit of happiness. Before Jefferson, before the thinkers of the Enlightenment, everybody existed for somebody else's good. Good king, good state, good church. Nobody existed for their own good. Jefferson said that each one of us has a moral right to pursue our personal happiness. We're not guaranteed success in that pursuit, but we have that right. That was a world-changing idea. He created the most successful country in history and the most benevolent. When people have the right to their own life, they're naturally nicer to other people. In socialist and communist society, at the end of the day, everybody ends up hating each other because they're all slaves to each other. And I agree with Jefferson. Each of us has the right to pursue our personal happiness. Let's talk a little more about the pursuit of happiness, however. Um, I, I talk a lot to college students, and I, this is a point that I try to reach them with. The pursuit of happiness, wow, what a selfish idea. You're going to go out and pursue your personal happiness. How selfish can you be? And selfish is bad, right? I can see uh, Johnny in the sandbox, three or four years old, playing with his truck, not bothering anybody, having a good time. Um, along comes Fred. Fred would like to have Johnny's truck. Johnny doesn't want to give him the truck. Discussion, debate, argument ensues. Mom, dad, Sunday school teacher, kindergarten teacher gets involved in the argument. And mom says, hey, Johnny, give that truck to Fred. Don't be selfish. Don't be bad. Two great moral lessons being taught right there in the sandbox, right? Where did Fred get the right to Johnny's truck? You want to know where our social welfare system comes? There it is, right in the sandbox. And now Fred would like for Johnny to provide him with a, a GMC Yukon. Why not? Right? But what about Johnny? And I bet everybody in this room is Johnny. What lessons did we learn? What lessons did we learn? We learned that we had some kind of moral obligation to take care of Fred. Even though Fred's lazy, incompetent, stupid, a guy we wouldn't want to spend five minutes with. And we got this obligation to take care of Fred. It's an interesting burden to assume, isn't it? Let's talk a little more about selfish because we get a, a false uh, discussion of selfish. Let's define selfish as acting in one's rational, long-term self-interest. Acting in one's rational, long-term self-interest. We're presented with this false dichotomy, which is to take advantage of other people or self-sacrifice, neither one of which makes any sense. In fact, a lot of people think that it's selfish just about taking advantage of other people. Here's the irony. Taking advantage of other people is not selfish. It's self-destructive. It's self-destructive in two ways. You know, you might fool Tom, Dick, and Harry, but they're going to tell Betty, Eric, William, Sarah, nobody's going to trust you. And if you're not trusted, you're not going to be successful, and you're certainly not going to be happy. You probably know people. But there's a deeper issue. While we all try to influence people, I'm trying to influence you. Um, if you let go of reality and you try to manipulate somebody else's mind, you try to take advantage of somebody else, you're going to do a lot more damage to yourself than you do to them. In my career, I've gotten to meet a lot of successful people. I've never met anybody that was both successful and happy that I think God they're taking advantage of other people. Now, I've met some people that have a lot of money that I think God they're taking advantage of other people. And they're the most unhappy people I have ever met. Taking advantage of other people is not selfish, it's self-destructive. How about self-sacrifice? Self-sacrifice is the moral code of our society. You hear it everywhere. You hear it at home, at church, on TV, in school. We're all supposed to self-sacrifice. I want to ask you to ask yourself what I would argue is the most important question you can ask yourself. And if you have children and grandchildren, I'd like for you to honestly think how you'd like for your children and grandchildren to answer this question. And here's the question. Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else has to their life? Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else has to their life? Of course you do. Of course you do. Why would you believe anything different than that? And by the way, if you are not willing to defend your right to your life, you cannot defend anybody else's right to their life. Because if I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life, if none of the eyes have a right to their life, 
nobody has a right to their life. You cannot defend individual rights unless you're willing to defend your right to your life. And by the way, that's when the Elizabeth Warren show up again. Because you don't have a right to your life, but she knows how your life ought to be spent. So taking advantage of other people and self-sacrifice neither the one make any sense. But there is a rigorous, demanding moral code that underlies free and prosperous societies. We are fundamentally traitors. We trade value for value. Life is about figuring out how to get better together. When I was running BD&T, we had a gut-level commitment to help our clients be economically successful and financially secure. And we expect them to make a profit doing it. Life is about figuring out how to get better together. There are only two stable relationship conditions, win-win and lose-lose. Whenever you get greedy and you set up a win-lose, you see this in spousal relationships, you end up in a lose-lose relationship inevitably. Interestingly enough, whenever you get self-sacrificial and you set up a lose I mean, you set up a, uh, a lose-win, uh, you'll get better, and you end up in a lose-lose relationship. So in any meaningful relationship in your life, you should ask, what's in it for me? That's a fair question. But you should also ask, what's in it for them? Because if there's nothing in it for them, at the end of the day, there'll be nothing in it for you. Life is about creating win-win relationships. And of course, it's in your rational self-interest to help the people you care about. People matter. Your family, your friends, the people you work with. Um, in fact, uh, if you love your children, helping your children is not a sacrifice. In fact, something I tell college students, love is the ultimate uh, form of selfishness. And that's not how people normally think about it. But I, I use the example, you're getting ready to get married, big event in your life. Your future spouse comes running up to you and says, honey, I'm so excited about marrying you. This is the biggest self-sacrifice I've ever made. <laughs> Not exactly what you wanted to hear. Right? Um, if you really love somebody, you would risk your life to protect them because they're so valuable to you. I'd hate to be faced with this choice, but if I had to choose between in my life and one of my children's lives, I'd say, you know, I'm going to die because I couldn't live with myself if I chose differently, if I sacrificed one of my children. Um, I believe it is in my rational self-interest to support the United Way. United Way is an umbrella charity organization, does a lot of good in the community, <clears throat> which I live, I wouldn't want to live in the kind of community that would exist if there were no United Way, and I wouldn't want my children to live in that kind of community. I believe it's in my rational self-interest to support the United Way. So what would you have to do to really act in your rational self-interest? Well, the first thing you'd have to do is what I call hold the context. A lot of times when people talk about selfish, they talk about taking advantage of other people, they're also talking about something I call tunnel vision. And there are people that are kind of self-focused. The irony is being self-focused is not rational. The first question you've got to ask is, what kind of world would I like to live in? And what would I enjoy doing making that world a little better place in, as, as I see it? What kind of world would I like to do, live in? And what can I do and what would I enjoy doing that might make that world a little better place? I'd have a sense of purpose. I take care of my body, I'd eat right, I'd exercise well, I take care of my mind, I'd read, study, think, I'd work hard to create healthy relationships with other people that share my values, and I'd have a rational value system. What if everybody had a sense of purpose, did the best they could to take care of their body, their mind, worked hard to create healthy relationships with other people that shared their values, and had a rational value system? I believe that the vast majority of the world's problems would go away. You constantly hear that the problem is people are selfish. My observation is very few people consistently act in their rational self-interest. Most people act in some form of self-destructive manner. I had a brother-in-law who <clears throat> drank 24 beers a day. Got so to the liver, drank 24 beers a day, died. People say he was selfish. No, he was self-destructive. <coughs> Bernie Madoff, the guy that stole hundreds of millions of dollars from his family and friends, he said the best day in his life is when he got caught. Can you imagine spending 30 years dealing with your family and friends? How miserable could you possibly be doing that? Um, in order to defend a free and prosperous society, you must first be willing to defend your right and everybody else's right to the pursuit of their personal happiness, as long as they don't violate anybody else's rights. That is the foundation for a free and prosperous society. One last thought about, uh, about happiness. Um, 
Happiness in the Aristotelian sense of a life well lived is the end of the game, right? Uh, happiness. Uh, sometimes business people can get confused. They think money is the end of the game. Money's a good thing, but it's not the end of the game. Happiness in that deep sense of the word is the end of the game. And the foundation for happiness is real self-esteem, not the from my cliche stuff they try to sell in schools today. Real self-esteem. Self-esteem is a complex subject, but I want to share with you a couple thoughts. First, self-esteem is fundamentally self-confidence in your ability to live and be successful given the facts of reality. So you earn self-esteem by how you live your life. Nobody can give you self-esteem. You cannot give anybody self-esteem. You cannot give your children self-esteem. Self-esteem has to be earned. Live your life with integrity, consistent with your values and your beliefs, and you will raise your self-esteem. And that's why integrity is so important. For everybody in this room, and the vast majority of people on this planet, the single biggest driver of your self-esteem is your work. We spend a disproportionate amount of time, effort, and energy at work. Uh, and you, I define work in the broadest context, raising children, very hard, very productive work. However you define your work, what makes it important is it drives your self-esteem. Something I've said many times to the employees at bb and it's real important to bb and that you do your job well, it's far, far more important to you. Might fool me about how well you do your job, might fool your boss about how well you do your job, but you'll never fool you. If you don't do your work the best you can do it, given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, you can't do the impossible. But if you don't do your work the best you can do it, you will lower your self-esteem. Now here's the good news. Do your work the best you can do it, given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, and you will raise your self-esteem, which is more important than whether you get a prom promotion or more money because it's about your character. And I think there's a very significant social issue that flows from that concept. Take a, uh, a construction worker, a bricklayer. He has a tough, hard, grinding life. My granddad had that kind of life. That bricklayer has a tough, hard, grinding life, but he gets something very important from his work. He and his, his wife successfully raised their children. Maybe his granddaughter becomes CEO of a publicly traded company, maybe not but he gets something really essential from that hard work. He gets to be proud of himself. He gets self-esteem. Take that same bricklayer and give him welfare. He may be better off financially, but he loses part of his soul. There's a lot of conversation in, in D.C., Washington, D.C. today, by both parties about uh, security. Uh, unfortunately, from an economic perspective, it has nothing to do with reality. But even if it did, it would be off mission. Americans care about security, but this is not the land of security. People didn't get on a boat and come to Jamestown to be secure. The United States is a land of opportunity. Opportunity to be great, opportunity to fail and try again. But most importantly, the opportunity of that bricklayer to live life on his own terms pursue his personal happiness based on his beliefs and his values. To pursue his happiness as a free and independent person. That's why people came to America. That is a unique, special sense of life that made America great that is very, very important that we protect. Thank you very much. I would be glad to answer questions about anything that anybody wants to talk about. Doesn't have to be about that. I'll be glad to answer anything. There's a brave man. Yes, sir. Uh, can you give us your perspective on what's going on with the NFL? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I think the national an anthem is a united fighting thing in our country, and I. It has bothered me long before Donald Trump brought this up, and these players were, you know, using that as a, as a method to uh, express their views. Uh, I would, if they want to do that, I don't think that's an appropriate thing to do. I think that the owners of the teams are really responsible. I mean, any business makes rules about how their employees have to behave, and we wouldn't let our employees do things like that that were disparaging to our customers, and a lot of the customers are disparaging. Now, I'm disappointed that Donald Trump handled it the way he did. I mean, 
I would I wish you were a grown up. <laughs> but, but he had a point, <laughs> and I think that's one of the the mixed mixed blessings about it. But I think the owners are the ones that are really responsible, and they ought to say, look, you know, you want to play on this football team. Um, this is something you have to do, and they do have behavior rules, and I'm, they should have enforced them. Uh, I, I have a problem too, and, and, and of course I look in here and see mostly white people, but the whole idea of white privilege. You know what privilege is? It's being born in America. People that have a right to complain are people born in Bangladesh. Anybody, 99.9% .9 of the people born in this country Man, if you got a privilege, just being born in this country, and that's a really—I don't think we should let that issue go. You know, I was debating in, on camp, college campuses about this whole issue of inequality, and I pointed out the obvious: there's practically no poor people in Baltimore. Poor people live in Bangladesh. That's where poor people live, not Baltimore. And and uh, and Cato publishes this out of Human Progress stuff. Dot org website that looks at what's happened. And what's happened in Bangladesh, inequality globally is in a free fall. Because per capita income in Bangladesh has gone from $200 a year to $600 a year. Now $600 sounds terrible, but compared to $200, it's, it's huge. And in places like China and India and Bangladesh and much of Africa, people's standard of living has been rising very radically. And so the global inequality has been in a free fall uh, uh, globally. And so this whole idea of white privilege, I'm saying, yeah, American privilege. If you're born in America, wow, what advantage you have over all the rest of the people in the world. And that doesn't mean we don't have warts and things we ought to worry about, but it's, it's a wrong, you know, you need to take it in that context, and that's not the context it's taking in, I think. Yes, sir. John, the Wall Street Journal says you're on a short list as the, potentially the next chairman of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> you probably can't comment on that uh, <laughs> speculation, but can you comment from your perspective uh, on the role of the Fed, or even the role of the government in, in stimulating or, or encouraging economic growth? What, what is the proper role of government from the libertarian capitalist perspective? Um, well, in the libertarian world, there is national defense, police, and a court system. So the government wouldn't control the monetary. There's no more reason for the government to run the monetary system than it would be for them to run Exxon. The reason governments run the monetary system is because they that's to finance wars. The government took over money because they wanted money, and, and they can print money to finance wars. Now they're trying to do it, use it for economic purposes, although the evidence is overwhelming that they're mistimed. <laughs> that they actually make recessions much worse than they would have been and they, and they, and they drive you know, excessive expansions like probably we have, I don't know, but probably we have in the stock market today. So they make a lot of mistakes. Um, several countries went for long periods of time with private banking systems where the money was, was private. Uh, and the United States was formed that way. The government was only supposed to coin money, right? It was supposed to take gold and make it into coins. And it was essentially a private banking system, uh, really up to the Civil War, when in order to finance the Civil War, <laughs> uh, the government really started taking over the monetary system. So I think, um, I think the risk implicit in a government monopoly of money is dangerous. I think it does encourage huge levels of debt, which we have. It does encourage too high spending, and it also, I think, encourages wars. World, it's interesting. World War One, which is, I don't know how many of you guys say, it's the stupidest war of all time. I think. I mean, it's gonna be hard to have a stupider war than World War One. But it, the reason that it got so bad is because that was the first time central banks financed wars, and so everybody could borrow out the kazoo boo. When, they, when traditionally the king was kind of constrained on how much he had to get his money from somewhere, right? And, and unless he had gold or something, the war would have ended many years before, or they never started if they couldn't have printed the money to finance the war. So I think government, the very fact that I think we ought to get rid of the Federal Reserve could be an issue, however. <laughs> I've been very open about that. I think it's done a lot of damage. I think it caused less, so that's the primary cause, Federal Reserve. And, Housing policy. 
Yes, sir. How do you think a currency like Bitcoin will shift, um, I guess, the monopoly on currency? I'm, one of the things we're doing at Cato is studying what we call cyber currencies. And I think you will see cyber currencies developed that actually can become competitive with the Federal Reserve. I'm not a big fan of Bitcoin because it's been used for so much speculation and, and lots of other, I mean, the economics of it don't, they, they befug me. It's mostly driven by stuff going on in China and India and places that they're trying to get around systems. But, I might be wrong about that, but I, the whole idea of cyber currency, I don't think you can drive the Federal Reserve out of business. But I do think you can do to the Federal Reserve what's happened to the post office. There's no question that FedEx and UPS have disciplined the post office. And the post office is a much better organization, it's still terrible, but it's a much better organization than it would have been if it hadn't been for that competition. And I think cyber currencies, what I would like to see is a cyber currency that instead of just based on, on um, you know, mathematics, has some connection to some physical commodity. It could be gold, could be you know, corn or soybeans or something. And I think when you really make that connection, the dilemma with cyber currencies, though, is when they really start working, the government's going to close them down. Mm -hmm. and, and they've done that over and over again. Um, and the prop problem today is, you know, states can issue currency. They can issue gold currency. And if they ever did, they'd drive the federal government out of business real quick. But the way the setup is, it, gold is treated as a commodity and you get taxed on it. So, you got, A, you've got to keep records on it, and B, you get taxed on it. They're going to do the same thing to Bitcoin and make it very hard not to get taxed on it. And you can't really have a currency if, if you have to pay taxes and the currency goes up or down and keep up with this kind of records. Yes, sir? I think you've uh, properly described the foundation of the United States as our belief in the universal rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think everybody in this room probably understands and appreciates that. Probably did even before you started talking about it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, out there in the rest of America, uh, we are a minority. <laughs> so how do we revive not only uh, the belief, but also the commitment to these ideas? And I, I gotta tell you, I mean, I teach kids this stuff, and it's easier to teach a 13-year-old about this than somebody 23, 33, or 43 about it. No, I think that's a great question. That's the reason I went to Cato, is to try to communicate that. I, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to help people understand how the financial crisis was caused by government policy, not by, you know, deregulation. But it's a hard message to get out because the media wants a different message. I think that the most, single most important issue would, in America, policy issue, is the privatization of education. I think if we had truly private education, we subsidized uh, students, subsidized uh, parents, if you want to, that's, I, I would actually support that. But private education, you'd have a revolution. Because I think the government controls the educational system, and, and fortunately there are a few people that are teaching good ideas, but the vast majority of teachers, first, what, they, what do they learn in college? Politically correct stuff. And now, of course, what we're seeing is a dumbing down of the people that go into teaching. You've seen, you know, lowest SAT scores and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's a, it's a very destructive environment. And if you think about it, and I, I was spent some time in D.C. with Cato, we have an inverted reward system for education. <laughs> um, you know, in business, if you, if you run a lousy business, you get to fail. In education, the D.C. public school says, what, what happens when they run a lousy schools? They get more money. They have more money per capita and the worst outcome in America. It's an inverted incentive system. And, uh, it, it stifles innovation and creativity, obviously. And I think that I think that there's radically better ways over time to teach kids, but it has to be done systematically. And and, and, and I don't know the answers, but I'm I'm for the privatization of education. Um, you know, Sweden. This is I, I think it's ironic that Bernie Sanders kept using Sweden as an example. Sweden's education system is largely for-profit private education. So, and it's very interting. <laughs> uh, by the way, the, you know, the premier of Sweden, when Bernie was talking about them being socialists, sent them about a big letter and said, hey, we're less socialists than the United States, which is true. <laughs> which is true. We rate them, you know, when Cato rates, Sweden are ranked way above the United States in, in uh, freedom. Uh, that's not good because we've been headed down the line. But
But anyway, they have a for-profit, private education system, and it works. It works. Um, whenever uh, I argue as a libertarian with my status friends, um, whether they're conservative status or uh, progressive status, um, when they're smart, we always come down to an idea of consent, you know, that they say, well, it, it, when they're smart, they say, well, you've consented to these laws about living, you know, so it's a, a, a version of saying, well, you, if you don't like it, you can leave. Nobody's making you stay here. Um, and I have a hard time figuring out, you know, I, I certainly did consent to the contract with my employer about certain things I'm not going to say, you know, all kinds of restrictions on my liberty. Freely consented to that. But I wouldn't necessarily say that I consented to everything in the, you know, federal register, you know, that sort of stuff. So I have a hard time figuring out where to uh, have an articulable, you know, uh, uh, crossover from, from uh, you know, what I've really consented to to what I haven't. Do you have any, you know, yeah. words of wisdom? To help I don't know about any beautiful words of wisdom. I, I've heard that argument, and my answer is I didn't consent. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm prepared to leave because there, there, there are worse places than this, and I'd like to change the argument. So I, I didn't consent. I didn't. In fact, very fortunately, in recent years, some people in North Carolina I voted for have been elected. But after <laughs> recent times, I you know, almost never voted for anybody got elected. So you know, I didn't consent. I uh, I do consent to the framework of the United States, the Constitution. In fact, isn't that our agreement? And aren't these laws supposed to be constitutional? And they are. I mean, there are only 17 things that Congress is supposed to do in, according to the Constitution, and they do 17,000 or 17 million. Who knows how many things they do? And so, yeah, I consent in a certain sense to the Constitution, but I don't consent to all these laws. But there's nothing I can do about it. I, I use the example in, uh, in running BBT. I got this from libertarians sometimes that uh, we, were, we had FDIC insurance. Well, we did because we had no choice. If we didn't have an FDIC insurance, we couldn't be in business. But FDIC insurance was hurting us, not helping us. But this is, the FDIC insurance is a subsidy for high-risk organizations, right? So bb and has been you know, in business since 1872. We've paid, I don't know, hundreds of millions, billions probably, I'm sure, billions of dollars into the FDIC insurance fund. We got nothing out of it, right? We just kept lousy competitors in business till they went broke. Uh, it's a rip-off. So did I consent to it? No. You know, I'm not sure, you know, remember government's people with guns. You know, uh, what do you mean I consented to it? If those people would put their guns away, then, then I might do different things, right? <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.